Começando aqui então o terceiro dia de Gastão Cop Seattle. Hoje um dia tipicamente de Seattle. Meio nebuloso, uns 220 dias nublados aqui por ano. Também começando a garoa. Quem a gente vai conhecer hoje é o Pike Place Market, que é um lugar conhecidíssimo, bem turístico atualmente. No passado, viam fazendeiros aqui comprar. A gente vai ver muita coisa engraçada por lá. Por exemplo, conheceremos Mr. The Bear. Ele que joga peixes, quer dizer, a gente vai ver peixes, frutas, verduras e mais algumas coisas também. É só aguardar. Nesse programa, a gente também vai ver um dos principais selos aqui de Seattle que você conhece muito bem, que é o Sub Pop, que realmente foi um dos responsáveis principais por esse Seattle Sound tão conhecido. É só aguardar nesse programa. About everybody, like you said, talking about Seattle, it's kind of actually died down a bit in the states now. It seems to have, everybody's just kind of like, oh yeah, and the people kind of look at the bands from here. It's just bands now. As opposed to, at first, everybody was so surprised that there were all these bands from here, all of a sudden that nobody knew about. I mean, they've been here for a hell of a long time, playing shows, making records, playing all over the United States and Europe. It's just that all of a sudden the door was open. Everybody saw all these bands and went, what? What's this? By Chris Cornell, is it a sign of friendship in, between the bands in here or among the bands? It was, well see, the thing is it was produced, it was co-produced by Terry Day and Chris Cornell and us too. And basically the whole idea of bringing Chris Cornell in was that he was, he's been a fan of the band for quite a long time, we've known him, you know. And uh, he does the Soundgarden stuff and it was like, Terry does mostly metal stuff, but we wanted to use him. And so we figured if Chris came in, we'd sort of act as like, you know, liaison. He, I mean, Chris knew what we were about. Terry probably wasn't quite sure at first until, you know, we did a lot of pre-production on it. So, uh, you know, it worked out great. Pretty, pretty cool. yes. Chris was actually only there for about, what, half of it? Two thirds of it? He had to leave. Where can I find the first album of Screen Trees Clairvoyance? Is it very <laughs> difficult? Yeah, well, there's only uh, 3,000 copies of it out there and about 500 or more of those are at college radio stations around the United States and I think we shipped about 200 to Europe itself and then I remember a couple hundred to Italy so it looks like there's probably a large concentration in Italy so if we can fly over there. You joined like in 1991, how was you join like the screen trees you left Skin Yard right Uh, yeah, it was, um, I guess it was about November of 1991, Skin Yard, we had done a European tour and we broke up, Jack was doing uh, production stuff. The band called me up and uh, went down and auditioned and um, got the job and about two months later we started recording the album. And pretty much since then we've just been on the, you know, on tour, on the road. We, we did a US tour, we did another tour with Alice in Chains and then we went to Europe with them. And then uh, just finished up this last U.S. tour, headlining again. So he was the only guy we auditioned. So yeah, it wasn't quite an audition. It was like, hey Barry, you want to be in the band? Okay, we'll come down and play with us. And we played one practice. And okay, have ever played together before? No, in fact, I hardly knew Barrett. I I'd met him. We had some friends in common. We knew Jack and Dino and stuff, and a couple other people. Met him at a skin yard show once, but that was it. And Drunk. <laughs> He was drunk as a skunk. O que a gente vai ver a partir de agora então é o estúdio onde muitas bandas gravaram por aqui. Nirvana, Soundgarden, uma padela. Aliás, quem vai contar isso vai ser Jack and Dino, Barrett Martin, que é o batera dos Queen Trees atualmente. Já tinha tocado com Jack and Dino numa banda chamada Skin Yard. E também Mr. Van. O Van é o baixista dos Screen Trees. Todos juntos falando um pouco, você vai ver só quantas bandas boas já passaram por esse estúdio. Conferindo agora, Studios. Oh, well, uh, we have this, um, this machine over here recorded the, uh, this, this little eight track machine here recorded the Nirvana Bleach record back in 88. Yeah, this is a eight track unit here. Not very glamorous, but uh, not plugged in as a matter of fact. But, uh, oh, you know, the whole, uh, I'm not going to say it. Yeah, he started, like, producing Seattle hard rock music. Was recorded. Okay. <laughs> I'm not using that, late, that word, that word. We don't use that word around here. We don't use the G word here. I almost said it. I'll stop. 
To me, simply having a band that sells a lot of records on my record label is not something that's particularly gratifying. Sure, I like to sell records, but I'm more interested in having music that I find to be like emotionally vital and to be interesting. Slip Pop started out as a fanzine in the U.S. in uh, 1979 uh, by myself. I was very interested in seeing how different uh, regions in the United States were developing, and so I would review independent records on a region-by-region -region basis. Uh, one thing led to another, and John and I hooked up in 1987. We started putting out records by local bands uh, from the Seattle area. Soundgarden being the uh, first venture that we worked on together it was the Screaming Life EP. It came out in the autumn of 1987. And we went from there to uh, working on the debut LP by Green River, a band which featured people who were later to be in Mother Love Bone, Pearl Jam, and most notably, Mud Honey. To me, Sub Pop is Mud Honey. You know, that's what I always thought of as the Sub Pop sound. Whenever someone said that to me, I, the first band that I thought of was Mud Honey. Bruce had this fanzine called Sub Pop, and I first met him like in 83. Yeah. And he used to come over to my house and we'd get drunk and listen to records. And uh, then he decided to put out a record by the U-Men on the Bomb Shelter label. That was his record store that at the department time. started up. And then he decided to, he eventually made like contacts all over the country. And he was like, his fanzine, sometimes tape compilations, and he decided to do a record compilation. That was Sub Pop 100. And then he got hooked up with Jonathan Poneman, who was really into the Soundgarden sound. And at the same time, I was in this band called Green River, who had just had a falling out with Homestead Records out of New York. And they both agreed to put out those two records pretty much at the same time. At that time, we were like the second release, the second EP that, that, that Sub Pop had put out. We were like, they had done, uh, a single and an EP with Green River, and they had done a, They did a single and an EP with us, and our popularity grew really quickly, a lot quicker than their label was growing, or as far as distribution, or as far as um, their popularity. So it was the only move for us really to make. Aproveitar então que a gente está num lugar tão característico de Seattle como o Pike Place Market e contar a origem do nome Seattle, qual, aonde que surgiu esse nome Seattle, né? Vamos falar um pouquinho de história então. Os colonizadores chegaram por aqui em 1850, na verdade era um capitão grego a serviço dos espanhóis. O cara até mudou o nome, depois virou Juan de Fuca, que é o nome do estreito que liga a Bahia daqui até o Oceano Pacífico, isso é muito legal. Quando eles chegaram aqui, já cruzaram os índios, logicamente, né? os nativos mesmo dos Estados Unidos, ficaram amigos dos índios e era o chefe Seal, conheceram o chefe Seal. Daí, pô, o cara foi tão legal com eles, o índio, que eles resolveram homenagear o nosso chefe indígena e botar o nome da cidade de Seal. Só que o que aconteceu? Vira assim, ah, onde é que você mora? Eu moro em Seal. Seal, 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 Seal. Acabou ficando Seattle, a cidade que tanto nós conhecemos. Não há alternativa de música lá, ou não há muito disso, porque em Juno você não pode ir para lá. Você tem que pegar um plane lá, ou você tem que pegar um lá. So it's very secluded, but because it's so tiny and secluded, um, the pe people do it themselves a lot more. There's a, it's got a really good arts community and theater community. Um, it's, um, it's just a kind of a yeah, do-it-yourself place. So I miss it. We've been touring with Screaming Trees for a month and a, about a month actually, and then we did a, a few shows on our own, and this was sort of a reunion tour. We, you know, we haven't seen it for a couple of weeks, so it's like, hey, good to see you again. The Sub Pop, they've been great to us. Um, I didn't think we were going to be on the label. They came and saw a show um, that we were playing, and I got all freaked out. I go, oh my God, they're here. What are we going to do? They're, you know, I'm going to. And then Chris said, they're not going to sign us. We're a pop band. We're not a grunge band. And anyway, don't worry about it. You're not going to get signed. Just go out and play your show. So we did, and apparently they were branching out and other stuff, and uh, 
surprise, surprise, they we ended up making a deal. Grunge? Yeah, I love you. Uh, I don't. Yeah, what is grunge? I'm not qualified. I'm from Portland. Yeah. I could. I'm. I can't. I'm, I can't speak on that.